Hey everybody, this is Mr. Matthew here, and this is video 1-2 for Honors Biology in our Ecology Unit. And in this video, we're going to look at biological species interact as population and communities as our primary theme. Within this, we're going to distinguish the different levels of organization within an ecosystem. We will also look at how, if you, how you can analyze data, specifically abiotic data, and then how that might influence uh, biotic factors within an ecosystem. We'll then look at the interplay between abiotic and biotic factors. We're going to look at um, exponential and logistic population growth, and we're going to apply that to human populations. We're also going to describe dependent and independent uh, limiting factors within an ecosystem. And then lastly, we're going to talk about different ways populations can interact. This will include predator-prey relationships, competition, and the three forms of symbiosis. So we're going to start here and we're going to distinguish between the different levels of ecological organization from species up to the biosphere. So we're going to look over on the diagram on the left. And what I want to start with is I want to focus in on one of these antelope that I have in the foreground. And that is going to be an individual. That is one individual antelope. Sometimes it's referred to as a species. And then if we look at the whole group of the antelope that live within this given area, we're going to call that a population. So population is a group of the same type of living thing that live in the same area. Now, if we look at, in addition to that population of antelope, the population of zebras that are in the back, along with the population of grass and other populations that are in this given area, that would be our community. So the collection of populations in a given area is our community. Then if we add the abiotic factors, the non-living factors in here, so we look at the soil, we look at the air, we look at the water, we put all those together along with, say, temperature, uh, and other factors, we'll get the ecosystem description. Now, in this particular case, we have a, an ecosystem is a grassland, and the grassland is going to be someplace on the globe, and it will have a characteristic temperature and precipitation pattern. If you remember from video 1-1, we called these biomes, and you can see in this middle diagram here, the graph of the precipitation versus temperature, and how we group similar areas that have similar precipitation and temperature into distinct biomes and those are going to have specific types of uh, living things that are going to be found in them that thrive within those uh, temperature and precipitation characteristics. If we look at all of the living spaces on the planet, uh, that includes the air, the water, and on land, that is called the biosphere and we represent that by our planet Earth here. Now, one of the things we can do when we look at a given ecosystem is we can analyze data and we can look at how abiotic components of an ecosystem and say changes in those specifically will then have an impact on biotic components of an ecosystem. And there's a variety of different ways we could do this. We could do this through field studies, but in this particular case, I'm going to highlight a, a laboratory study. So what you can see here is over on the left, I have this diagram. It says tolerance to salinity. So this represents a field where we would plant different crops and then maybe add slightly different salt concentrations to different rows to see how salt tolerant the various crops can be. You can imagine that in an area close to the ocean um, where you might get a little bit of salinity into uh, the water and possibly into the soil, it'd be useful to know which crops will do well and specifically which mutants of crops will do well um, given certain salinities. Over on the right, I have grabbed a figure from a journal article, and this was done using three different mutants of a commonly used plant called Arabidopsis, um, and Arabidopsis is a plant that's used in a lot of experiments. The, the key up on the top shows me the wild type, that's with the squares, and then I have this EXP2, which is one mutant, and then that long alphabet number thing underneath is a third mutant that we're looking at. In this case, we're looking at seed germination in a salt solution. So you can see that it says 200 millimolar NaCl, and that's just to tell you it's a salt solution. And what we find is that in all cases, for the first four days, there's no germination. But we start to get a little bit of germination um, in day five, 
and then we have a little bit higher percentage in day six. And by seven, one of those mutants has done very well. And so we can see that in that that second mutant, the one that's on the bottom, the one that's indicated by the triangles, is that that mutant does very, very well when we raise the abiotic factor of salt. The wild type only has about a 10%, so we're seeing almost a six-fold increase in germination rate in the presence of salt. And then the other mutant does very, very poorly where there's almost no germination whatsoever. And so this is a good example of how we can analyze data and depict changes in an abiotic factor in the ecosystem and how that might impact certain living things. In this particular instance, we could be making some predictions about how these different mutants might do in different environments. Now, let's move into looking at actual uh, biotic and abiotic factors together. So on the left here, I have a food web from Chesapeake Bay. And over on the right hand side, what I end up having is uh, this is a more nuanced uh, aquatic ecosystem that includes uh, the nitrogen, phosphorus, silicon, oxygen, and how those go in. So we're going to add both the biotic and abiotic factors into there. So it's not just the community. It's going to have the ecosystem level there. And again, I want to give you some samples here. So we'll start with the uh, image over on the left, and I'm going to ask you to pause and think. And so I want you to take a look at that diagram, and I want you to imagine what do you think will happen if I removed the bivalves. So let's say there was a virus that came around and there it struck a large percentage of the bivalves, and we're going to lose 50% of the bivalve population to Chesapeake Bay because of a virus. I'd like you to think of what are the impacts on some of the other populations within this community? Why don't you pause and think? All right, so hopefully what you came to the conclusion of is that if the bivalve population was to go down, you might see a rise in the phytoplankton you might see a rise in zooplankton. Um, the zooplankton and the phytoplankton are both consumed by the bivalves. You might also see a rise in the small planktivorous uh, fish because they're in competition uh, with the bivalves for food. But you also might see a decrease in the sea ducks and the sea tundras, uh, or the tundra swans, rather, uh, because they're not getting... Uh, as much food or do not have as much available food in the ecosystem. So these are other ways that you can make claims based off of changes of factors within an ecosystem. All right, so the next thing that we're going to look at is I would like to look at different types of population growth. And so over on the left hand side, what you can see is you see a population that is undergoing at first at time point zero a lag phase growth where we have a slow ramping up and that moves into what is known as log phase or exponential growth. So up through the first time point one to time point one and a half, we often will call this exponential growth or a J-shaped growth. And there are some graphs where that's just what it looks like. We have abundant available resources, available space, very little competition within the population, and we're going to see a rise there. Then at time point two, what you'll see is that the growth rate starts to decrease and it starts to level off. And that by time point three or time point four, we've leveled off at sort of maximum population that this ecosystem can uh, su support. And we call that carrying capacity. Now, the full growth, if we go from zero up to say time point four, time point five, we refer to that as a logistic growth curve or an S-shaped curve. And you can sort of see the S shape that is associated with that graph. So these are the two ways we generally will describe uh, population growth curves as either being exponential or J-shaped or logistic and S-shaped. So now if you look over on the right, this is the um, human population on Earth. And so you can see that growth. And I'd like you to pause and think, and which is a better descriptor for human population? Would it be more appropriate to call it exponential or logistic? Pause and think. And so hopefully what you noticed is that this is in fact a J-shaped curve, so it would be more appropriate to call this a 
exponential growth curve. And then you could start asking some obvious questions. What are going to be the factors that lead to seeing the growth rate decreasing as we see on the graph on the right? At what point will that curve start to turn from a J into an S? All right, next factor we're going to talk about here is uh, density dependent and density independent limiting factors. So a limiting factor is really any factor that's going to determine where that carrying capacity of an environment is going to be. In other words, what are the factors that cause that curve to start going from the J to the S? Over on the left hand side we see three common density dependent limiting factors. And now density de dependent limiting factors are going to be factors that are going to impact the population because it is dense, because there are more individuals. So one factor that increases um, it with population size is competition. If there's more individuals trying to get access to food or to space or water. We're going to see that that we're going to see an increase in competition. If there's a large population, also large populations tend to support predators as opposed to small populations. If you have only one or two individuals, there's not really enough energy in that ecosystem to support the predators that would hunt that individual. In fact, once those small numbers of individuals are killed, the predator cannot be supported. And so predation is also very heavily uh, density dependent. And then the third one that's listed is what we call parasitism and disease. And you know this because if you spend time in crowded areas with lots of other individuals, you're more likely to be exposed to parasites or viruses um, because there are more individuals who can carry them. This is just basic, um, the idea that crowds are going to support these pathogens, but if individuals are really, really spaced out, there's very little opportunity for a, a disease-causing uh, agent to spread from one individual to another, and therefore you decrease um, how much spread there will be as population goes down. Now over on the right, we have unusual weather and natural disasters, and we call these density independent limiting factors. So you have some weather event that hits a specific area. It doesn't matter if you're a member of a large population or a small population, these weather events are going to strike all individuals equally. So it doesn't matter if it's a big population or a small population, you have an earthquake and every member of the population is gonna be impacted, small, large, it doesn't matter the type of population. Similarly, a weather, this could be hurricanes or tornadoes or droughts, it's going to have an impact across the board on all individuals in that given area. Now, obviously, weather events can be tied to things that could be competed for, such as water, as in my last example. So there, there is a little bit of a gray area, but if we're specifically talking about a weather event or a disaster, you're normally just talking about density independent. All right, so what are some other ways that populations can interact over time. Well, on the left, what I have is I have the examples of predators and prey. I know this is a very idealistic graph, but what you can see here is the prey is going to be represented by the blue line. And as that prey population goes up, just as I had mentioned in the previous slide, uh, predator-prey interactions are going to be density dependent. Now that I have a lot of prey in that first uh, bump for the blue line, I can now support a predator. And so as a result, what you're going to see is an increase in predator population. As the predator population rises, the prey population is going to crash. And then as the prey population declines, you see the predator population decline. And this will go in cycles. Now, obviously, this is sort of an idealized um, graph. And if, in fact, at any point we got to the prey population or predator population is zero, um, it really actually wouldn't work. But you understand the general trend that there is a lag between when the predator population um, is going to spike compared to where the prey spikes. Prey will spike first, followed by the predators. Then you'll see a decline in the prey, followed by a decline in the predators. And this is a pretty common uh, population uh, interaction that we'll see. Over on the right, we see a wetland in Boxborough, and in that wetland it is filled with an invasive species called purple loosestrife. Now, this purple loosestrife is everywhere, and this is highlighting the idea of competition. Now, competition can be between two members of the same species, or it can be between two different species. I put the purple loosestrife in there because the purple loosestrife have outcompeted a lot of native species of things like cattail. So if we were to have taken this picture, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, which I am not old enough to have done, 
believe it or not. Uh, we would have not found purple loosestrife in this area, but we would have found native wetland plants like cattails and swamp milkweed and, and that sort of thing. But over time, we have seen a competition between the non-native or invasive purple loosestrife that has come in and outcompeted the native plants for resources. So competition is another key interaction between uh, species, and it can shift what populations are present in an area over time. The last thing we're going to discuss is three different forms of symbiosis. Now, symbiosis is where one individual lives in or on another organism. You're familiar with symbiosis and some of these forms. Um, we're just going to put some names over it. So on, on the far left, what I see is I see what I refer to as the good bad form of this and this is called parasitism and the reason we i say good bad is that parasitism is good for the parasite in this case the tick and it is bad for the host in this case the human or it could be the deer or it could be the dog or whatever the mammal it is that the tick is going to bite on the tick is going to live in or on a host, it is going to take nutrients in a, away from that host and it's going to gain. The host is losing um, energy or losing nutrients and as a result it is a negative relationship for the host but it's a positive relationship for the parasite. In the middle we have an up close view of uh, coral. Now coral is actually an animal but if you notice it's kind of got a greenish tinge to it and the reason this has a greenish tinge to it is because there's an algae that lives inside this coral. This is a form of symbiosis that is a good good. It is good for the coral, it is good for the algae and so both the animal and the algae are going to benefit from this relationship and we call this a form of symbiosis known as mutualism. In mutualism, both members benefit from this. In this case, it, we would call the host the animal, the coral animal, and we would refer to the algae inside as uh, being the symbiont that lives inside that host. Over on the right-hand side, we have our third type of symbiosis, which is known as commensalism. And this is what I refer to as good neutral. This is good for the organism that's getting the benefit. In this instance, it's the bird nesting in a tree. The bird is getting a place to live. It is neutral for the tree. In this instance, the tree is not really being benefited, nor is it really being harmed by the presence of this bird. So in this instance, this is really, really hard to know about. You need to dive in deep and, and learn, in fact, is the bird providing any sort of service for this tree or is it being harmed by this tree? In this instance, I'm getting a superficial view and I'm just going to assume the bird's benefiting, the tree's getting no obvious benefit for this, and so therefore we're calling this commensalism. All right, so that is a summary of our ecosystem structure and how biological species interact as population and in communities. I hope that that was helpful and I will be back soon.